All right, folks. Well, it's seven o'clock. So let me welcome you all to Siskiyou Land Trust Winter Webinar Series. I am Renee Casterline with the Siskiyou Land Trust and happy to be here with all of you this evening and to share this presentation tonight that I am certain is going to be packed with a lot of useful information uh, for all these folks who like to get out and enjoy the outdoors. So thanks to everyone who's joining us here on Zoom and um, who are also watching on Facebook. So I want to get us started because I know John has a lot to share. And um, John is a tremendous resource. He um, w lived in Siskiyou County for quite a time. Now he's up in Oregon. But um, we know him locally as a person who loves spending time out, outdoors and has done so to such a degree that he has published numerous books. Um, but as we were getting ready for tonight's webinar, I was asking him questions about a trip I'm thinking about. So John has been um, just, you know, put together such valuable resources for those of us who like to enjoy the North State. And that North State, that's really broad. He's just um, put out a book of urban trails uh, quite a bit farther south uh, from where we are here in Mount Shasta. So lots and lots of resources there and um, really good conversation that happens on um, the Facebook feed for Northern California hiking. So for any of you who are not yet familiar with John, this webinar will be a great way for you to get to know him and um, we'll share resources in the chat panel, so uh, you'll be able to um, look there to see the ways that you can connect with him on social media and through the website, as well as the many guidebooks. So um, I don't want to spend too much time giving an introduction with John to John because he's got so much to say. So we're going to turn the presentation over to John so that he can get started. He's got some wonderful slides and information to share with us. So remember to use the Q&A as you have questions that come up and enjoy the presentation. All right, John, it's all yours. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, Renee. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to be able to share my love of dispersed camping and the outdoors with all of you that are are listening. I'm grateful to you, Renee, and also to Kim Solga and the Siskiyou Land Trust for this opportunity. And I also want to tell everybody out there that the Siskiyou Land Trust, as you just heard at the beginning of this, uh, of this presentation, the Siskiyou Land Trust does really, really important work to preserve land and protect land here in Siskiyou County. So I strongly urge you to support Siskiyou Land Trust. If you live away from Siskiyou County, I'm sure you have parts of the country that are very, very important to you. There are land trusts all over the place. Find the ones that speak the most to you and make sure that you support them. Well, Siskiyou County has a very, very special place in my heart. So I'm just truly blessed to be here tonight to, to share my, my thoughts and my experiences on dispersed camping. So here's what we're gonna talk about tonight. These are the main topics. We're going to first define dispersed camping. We'll then go through and talk about typical rules and regulations. We'll also focus a bit on ethics and safety, especially on wildfire safety. That's just a key point I really, really want to emphasize whenever you are in the outdoors, including when you are dispersed camping, we know that the North State, Northern California, the entire West is seeing increased severity of wildfire conditions with longer wildfire seasons and we all know the horrific wildfires we've had to deal with in recent years. So you need to make sure you don't start a wildfire. More about that later. We'll talk about leave no trace, the importance of being prepared when you go out there to do dispersed camping because just almost by definition, you're usually quite a ways away from other people and you need to be self-reliant. We'll talk about vehicles for dispersed camping. I'll go through the basics of finding a good dispersed camping site. 
We'll also at the end talk about uh, a couple of good places where you can go disperse camping in Siskiyou County. I'll give you some specifics on that. And then I'll talk in general more about great places to go for you to explore on your own in Siskiyou County. What I'm gonna to say tonight, I'm gonna to give you a lot of really important information so you can get out there and enjoy Siskiyou County, Northern California, the Western United States, wherever you like to do dispersed camping. Most of what I'm going to be saying is applicable to the entire country as far as dispersed camping goes. At the end, I will get more specific about Siskiyou County. So if you're listening, just be aware that there's good information for you no matter where you live. There are more details in my book, Camp for Free, uh, Dispersed Camping and Boondocking on America's Public Lands. So if you want more information, feel free to go get that book. I think uh, Kim will be sharing links to that. And uh, I have a website, dispersedcamping.net. If you type in dispersedcamping.net, it will take you through to a, uh, a homepage on my main Northern California hiking trails.com website. And then from there, I have several key resources. I'll, I'll say a bit more about them as we move on through the presentation. So here I am with my sweetheart, the love of my life, Stephanie Hoffman. We are in the back of our Kia Sedona minivan, which we have affectionately named the Hotel Sedona. This is a couple of years ago when we were starting a big trip to the Southwest. And so, yes, we love dispersed camping and I've been doing dispersed camping all, I, I don't know, for at least 30 plus years. I was born in Shasta County and near, near Redding, grew up in and around Redding. Most of my life I've either lived in Siskiyou County or I've lived adjacent to Siskiyou County and Shasta County. I lived in Del Norte County for quite a few years. And right now I live in Ashland, Oregon, just to the north. And Siskiyou County is where I go almost all the time. When I want to go hiking, that's where I go. So I just have a great love for Siskiyou County. Some of you, um, some of you may know that I've written several hiking guidebooks on Northern California. And there they are. My most recent one is Urban Trail Sacramento that actually just launched a week ago, literally a week ago. You can see my other books there, except for Camp for Free, my hiking guide books are all published by Mountaineers Books. Camp for Free is published by Get Outside Press, which is my publishing company. I love to hike, I love being in the outdoors, and I really love to share, um, really love to share the outdoors with other people. My goal is to get people, my main mission is to get people outside into nature, away from all the hustle and bustle of civilized life so they can get more in touch with really what it means to be a human being, what's in our DNA and what's what has come through our, our evolution over time where we, our ancestors spent almost all their time out of nature. And I want us to get out there more and do that. What is dispersed camping? Well, first of all, it takes place on public lands. I'll talk more about those types of public lands a little later. It is usually free. Basically think of it as free, although there are a few instances where a few national forests have like annual, passes you have to buy just to be on the forest, but those are few and far between. Typically, it doesn't cost you anything. It is not in an organized official campground. This means there's no water faucet that you can turn on and get drinking water. There is no toilet where you can go do your business. There are no picnic tables for you to sit at. There's not a really nice setup um, official campfire ring for you. So you need to be aware of that. It's just you out on typically a piece of bare land. These sites are also subject to specific rules and regulations. These are gonna vary by the jurisdiction, but just keep in mind, there's always rules and regulations. You wanna make sure you follow those rules and regulations. That is crucial that you do that. What is the difference between dispersed camping and boondocking? Well, dispersed camping can take place 
anywhere on these public lands that you can legally safely and get to with your vehicle. There are a wide variety of vehicles. We'll talk more about them soon, but boondocking is the term that people who drive RVs use for dispersed camping. When they go boondocking in their RV, they are doing dispersed camping. However, RVs can only go certain places because they are almost by definition pretty darn large. So there's a lot of narrow dirt roads they can't go on. There's a lot of rough dirt roads they can't go on. So I always use the term dispersed camping, but I put boondocking in the title of my book and I do refer to it a little bit from time to time, but just be aware of that, of that difference. Uh, boondocking is the narrower definition. Some other terms you'll see for dispersed camping, remote camping, dry camping, wild camping is a term that a lot of Europeans use. You don't hear that much here, but it's quite common in Europe. Two other terms you'll hear are primitive camping and free camping. These can mean just straight out dispersed camping, but they can also refer to some more out of the way, smaller campgrounds that oftentimes are free and may have some amenities. They might have a, uh, they might have a, they might have a picnic table. They might have a pit toilet, but they probably wouldn't have running water. But that's something for you to also consider when you're out there. If you're traveling around, and you may do some out and out remote dispersed camping, and then you may also want to hit some of these actual, like semi-official or actual official, perhaps Forest Service primitive campsites. Dispersed camping is something that, as I said, I've been doing for 30 plus years. And it is really my way to get back into nature and really connect with nature. It's a way to really get out into the wilderness. That's why it's something that I just do over and over again, sometimes just for three or four days, sometimes for weeks at a time. And as I'll discuss later, at one point, I spent the better part of nearly two years actually living in a van and doing a lot of dispersed camping. Another thing I really like about dispersed camping is just being way out in nature and having solitude not having to hear cars, not hearing freeways or trains or leaf blowers or hedge trimmers, TVs, boom boxes, people's stereos in their cars, all those sorts of things. That's part of civilization. There are good things about civilization, but there are times I really just like to get away from it and have that quiet and have that solitude. Finally, what I really uh, love about dispersed camping is it allows me to get out and hike. As you can guess from writing all these hiking guidebooks, I really love to hike. Many, many of these places where you can go dispersed camping, many of them are near established hiking trails. So you can just go to those trails and hike, or you can just hike from your dispersed camping site. You're on a dirt road Frequently, you can just keep walking on that dirt road, which connects to other dirt roads, and you can just do a really good hike on dirt roads. I do that very often, and Stephanie and I do that very often when we're out exploring. There are always going to be rules and regulations for dispersed camping. For example, there are going to be restrictions on where you can do it. Each agency will have some roads that are open, some roads that are closed, some areas that will be open to dispersed camping and some places that won't. And you need to make sure that you find out what is what roads are available, what sites are available and, and what aren't. There's also rules about the characteristics of the site, meaning that they want you to not do any environmental damage when you do dispersed camping. So they don't want you driving through a meadow. They don't want you driving over vegetation. They want you to do it on land that is bare, usually already cleared when they were building the road, or perhaps it was cleared when they logged the area 60 years ago. You'll actually find, I've actually done quite a bit of dispersed camping um, in areas where logging has happened in the past. There's a nice big clear area and, while that can be 
uh, sometimes we look at logging and we think, oh, I wish this was an old growth forest. You also get to see forest succession. You get to see shrubs coming up and flowers and things like that. So uh, there can be some advantages to that. So be looking for those types of places. Other types of rules and regulations, seasons, of course, Oftentimes they will just close down certain roads during the winter season or if they need to protect an area for a sensitive plant or something like that. There are always length restrictions about how long you can be in a certain site. Oftentimes 14 days is typical, but this can vary. There can also be rules about how many days total in a year that you can be in a certain national forest. It might be say 30 days and then they would say, no, you have to move on from this national forest to another national forest, things like that. And again, this varies by jurisdiction. So wildfires, I just wanted to put special emphasis on this because I live in Ashland. We had a huge fire start in Ashland and burn north through the two adjacent towns, Talent and Phoenix, burned nearly 2,000 buildings, and we're still trying to recover from that. And Siskiyou County has had major fires that have burned structures and lots of land. Shasta County, Butte County, I mean, just all over California, we've been having really bad wildfires. It is just crucial that you do not start a wildfire when you are dispersed camping. Campfires. I have not had a campfire in over a decade and only maybe two or three in the decade prior to that. I strongly urge you to skip the campfire and there are very good reasons to do that. For one, you don't have to deal with smelling the smoke. For two, you can see the beautiful stars at night in all their glory without having your vision um, hampered by the light of the fire. You don't have to smell all of that smoke and you don't have to get the smoke on your clothes. Furthermore, if you want to cook, you can cook much, much better on a portable gas stove or a lot of the vehicles that many of you use for dispersed camping. You've got a stove inside your vehicle, so you can cook on that. So those are good reasons to not have a campfire. If you are going to have a campfire, you need to follow all regulations. For starters, you need a California campfire permit. If you look down at the bottom there, you'll see a link, preventwildfiresca.org. That is a, a website produced by Cal Fire. You can get your California campfire permit down there. And you can also get a lot of information about what to do to promote fire safety and to have a, have a safe campfire. You wanna be careful with your portable stove. If you're using a lighter to, I don't know if you smoke or something like that, you just be careful with anything that could, that is sparky, could start a flame. This includes making sure you don't drive your vehicle through vegetation. You could be giving off sparks from your exhaust. Anything could happen there. Make sure you don't do that. That's part of ethics. Some, some key advice about um, starting a or create or starting a campfire and then also putting a campfire out safely is put out by yes, is well put out by preventwildfiresca.org. They have this great uh, infographic that I'm sharing with you here. Um, I really hope that if you do decide to have a campfire, and I know for some people it's, it's a ritual, it's a social thing, the, you, it's an elemental thing that goes back to all my ancestors used to cook food on the fire. And I get that. I know some of you are going to have that. I'm never going to give you stink eye if I see you out there and you have a fire or if you tell me, yeah, we had a, a campfire. But if you do do it, I really hope you're at its first campsite that already has an established campfire ring. I hope you wouldn't think, oh, I'm going to make my own ring. Uh, unless it really is just really just bare ground there. If you're going to do it, this tells you how to do it. Basically, you have to make sure you have a, a clear space 10 feet in diameter where if sparks get out, it won't start a fire and that you, you ring it with rocks and you don't build a fire any larger than you need to. You have to make sure that you're 
always ready to put out a fire if it does start to get away from you. You need a shovel and water. You got to watch it. When you put it out, drown, stir, and feel. Pour water, stir it, pour water, more water, put your hand over and feel. Just make sure you do this. And just truly, it's, it's crucial. Leave no trace principles are also really important for us as dispersed campers to make, think, make sure that we are doing our ethical part there. You can read that there. I know most of you are already familiar with those principles. You can just Google it. There's a, a website, uh, an official website for Leave No Trace that has put forth these, these seven principles. A key one I just wanna mention is uh, traveling on durable surfaces, make sure that you stay on established official roads and that you don't take your vehicle off of that, including when you're actually at a dispersed campsite. Don't go barreling across a meadow and destroy vegetation. Here's an example. When we were in the Northern Trinity Alps a few years ago, at a dispersed campsite. You can see this site, for one thing, there's flammable vegetation all around it, and they left trash in the campfire. We also found other trash strewn around this site. What we do, and I hope you will do the same, we always take a, a big plastic uh, garbage bag with us. We pick up all that trash that we see around our campsites, and then we take it home, and we dispose of it properly. Vehicles for dispersed camping. First, let me say, pretty much no matter what you drive, you can still do dispersed camping. Some vehicles allow you a lot more options than others. I spoke about RVs earlier when I mentioned boondocking. They can only go on the big, wide, flat, good dirt roads. But for example, to me, what I think was the overall best vehicle for being able to get to the most places while still allowing you to sleep inside your vehicle and give you some comfort in the vehicle would be a full-size van with high clearance and four-wheel drive. That would let you get down most dirt roads. And then when you got there, you could be nice and comfy inside your van. So as I alluded to, there's compromises with any vehicle. But even if you have, say, a Toyota Camry or something like that with pretty low clearance, you can still go dispersed camping in a lot of areas. You just have to make sure that you really pay attention to the limitations of your vehicle. So here is what we are currently using when we travel and what we are using for our dispersed camping. This is a Kia Sedona minivan. It is essentially the same size as the much more well-known and famous Toyota Sienna, Honda Odyssey. The minivan is uh, the choice that we made. Every choice is a compromise, of course. We went with this because I wanted a vehicle that could just be my vehicle that could be my normal, just driving around all the time vehicle, but also have the minimum requirements we needed to be comfortable to sleep and have all our stuff and be out of the elements. And it's also, it actually has pretty good clearance. It has about nine or 10 inches of clearance, which is, which is pretty good. This is maybe not the most attractive picture because I've got all the doors open. This is when we took a big trip in May of 2019 through Southern California, Nevada, and then Southern Utah into the beautiful sandstone country of the Colorado Plateau. Well, here we are in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument off Hole in the Rock Road. But what I specifically want to show you here, um, you can see with my mouse pointer, this is our bed right here. Here is our platform. And this platform right here, we can lift up this platform. There's a rope that we can attach to a little hook here that holds that up that allows us to get into this food bin. And then our ice chest here. We have a really good ice chest. It's not a Yeti, it's a Yeti knockoff, but it works absolutely great. It keeps our stuff cold for at least five days unless it's really, really hot outside. With our minivan, we had all of the rear seats taken out, not just folded down, but taken out. So we had extra room down here. These wells go down to about like this low. So we were able to fit in this big bin and this ice chest. 
Underneath this platform, we have six large plastic bins where we have all of our clothes, all of our equipment and supplies, all of our water, all of that stuff. So it really just has everything we need. Our bed, you can see us right here, coming back to the photo I showed you earlier, our bed is a, a really high quality piece of foam. And uh, now we have memory foam on top of that. We bring our pillows from our bed at home. We have a really comfy flannel lined rectangular sleeping bag. We sleep great in that van. I mean, it is fantastic. So this really works for us. A couple more things back here. You can see we got a folding table. We got some folding chairs. So we want to sit outside. We sit outside. We can cook, do all of our stuff, enjoy the outside. Then in the evenings, what we do, we are either outside without a campfire, enjoying the beautiful starry night. Usually, oftentimes, it's very, very clear, dark skies way up in the mountains. Then when we are getting about Close to getting ready to sleep, we like to read before we go to sleep. We sit in the front seats. We have a solar lamp that charges in the sun. We just hang it there. We read, we go to bed, and we're, we're perfectly happy with that. We may eventually down the road get a larger van, like a full-size van or maybe a Sprinter van that has more amenities inside of it. We're definitely open to that. A lot of people do that because they want more comfort, and I understand that, totally understand that, but this is what uh, is working for us. I did most of my dispersed camping in a full-size van. This is a 1991 Ford Econoline. I bought this on the island of Kauai when I lived there for three years in the late 1990s. I bought it on the island from a friend of mine. He had uh, done some basic things to it. You can see those two windows there. There are sliders there with screens. There's two more on the other side. And he put in cabinets and a sleeping platform. For much of 1999 and 2000, with a interlude of living about maybe six or seven months in Chico during the winter, I traveled in this van and did dispersed camping all over the Western United States, especially in Utah, because I really, really love Utah, but also Nevada and Idaho and Arizona, uh, Oregon, of course, Northern California, um, and I spent a lot of time in Mount Shasta. I actually spent the summers in Siskiyou County and did a lot of exploring in Siskiyou County, a lot of, a lot of hiking. Some of you, maybe a few of you that are watching this right now, you may have met me during the summer of 99 and 2000, maybe in Asbeen's coffee shop or just out on the trail somewhere. And you may remember me tooling around in that van. And when I was in that van, I had my two trusty companions, Hana and Molly. Golden Retrievers are great dogs. I sure love, love those dogs, really miss those dogs. I traveled in a van with dogs. You can do it. They were great hikers. They were up for everything. Wasn't always the best when it was raining and muddy outside and I had to try to dry them off with a towel and get them back in, but uh, that was a lot of fun. After the Ford Econoline van, I, in 2001, bought a brand new Subaru Outback, which is uh, overall pretty good, pretty good vehicle. For dispersed camping with two people, though, you can't both fit back there, at least not with me. I'm six feet tall. If it's two shorter people, you probably could sleep in the back there, but you wouldn't have much room for your stuff. You'd have to pile that in the front seats and outside. But you can see we are in southern Utah. And you can see we had to pitch the tent there. You can see Stephanie over to the left reading. When you were in a, a vehicle like this and you have to pitch a tent, there are downsides to dispersed camping with a tent. That's why I urge you, if you can, try to set it up so you can comfortably sleep in your vehicle. You'll sleep so much better because you'll be out of the elements. Uh, the mosquitoes, the wind, the rain, you will be uh, a bit warmer and you will just overall sleep a lot better. For example, the very next night we hiked through a wild horse slot canyon. The next day 
the weather report called for a 20% chance of thunderstorms. And I thought, eh, 20%, ah, we'll be fine. 80% chance it'll be good. And if it does, that's be a little bit. So we set up the tent and yeah, that 20% thunderstorm came right over us and parked blew 50, 60 mile an hour winds. The winds were so strong that they snapped one of those two main poles that give the structure to the tent. We had to bail out of there. It was just blowing and raining so hard. Stephanie had to stay in the tent as ballast to keep it from blowing away. Well, I took down the tent around her, took all the stuff out of there and crammed it into the car and then wrapped up the tent and she ran to the car and we uh, had to, to hightail it off to Green River on I-70 to, to a motel because it was just that stormy. And that's the problem with the tent. If we'd had a regular vehicle, we would have been, we would have been able to just sleep in it. We would have been relatively, we would have been fine. There are plus sides. So here's our tent. This is off uh, Scott Mountain Summit there on Highway 3 in Siskiyou County. This is looking north off to the Russian wilderness. This was a fantastic dispersed campsite. You have to figure out how you're going to arrange things in your vehicle. When I was in the Subaru Outback and traveling alone, I always slept in the back. And you can see what I did here since I am six feet tall. I had to sleep on a diagonal, my head up here, my feet down here. And even then it was a little, little cramped. This is where I had all my clothes. This is the ice chest. And when you're in a smaller vehicle, you have to pile all your crap in the front seat and it's all there. You can't see it, but it is there. Let's move on to a discussion of all the land that is potentially open to you to do dispersed camping in the United States. I think it is clear from this map that it is best in the West. All that red is federally owned land. Most of it land that you can potentially do dispersed camping on about 25% of the total area of the United States is federal lands. Here are the forest service lands. And the yellow that you see right in here, these are national grasslands and that's on the edge of the Great, Par uh, Great Prairie. All that green though, national forest, much of that land is open to dispersed camping. And if you look over here, Here's Northern California and here's Siskiyou County. There's forests all over here, all over. And you can see stretching all the way down the Sierra Nevada, past Yosemite here, even down in Southern California, there's some. And then you see throughout the West, there's a lot more. I know we probably don't have many people here from the Eastern United States, but if you do do a big road trip across the United States, you will see that up in Minnesota, Wisconsin, there are some national forests there. Over here in the, the Southeast, there are places you can do it, but it's, a, it's nowhere near as easy just because there's just not that much land there. That's the Forest Service land. Here is the BLM land. Let's first concentrate again here over on Northern California and Siskiyou County. You can see that in Siskiyou County, there is not much BLM land. However, to the north in Oregon, there's a lot. And then when you start moving out beyond into Nevada and Eastern Oregon and Southern Idaho and much of Utah down here in Southern California, there are just a ton of BLM land and BLM land is a great place, just great for dispersed camping because usually there's hardly anybody else on it. And I'll talk a bit more about how to find places where the crowds aren't in a bit, but really notice that BLM land there as a great place to go. There are other national or, or national federal lands that you can do dispersed camping on. First, let me say you basically cannot do it in national parks. There may be one or two minor exceptions, but for the most part, national parks are a no-go for dispersed camping. So don't think that you can go to Yosemite and do dispersed camping in the park, you cannot. But you can do it in national monuments like here, like I was uh, discussing with Utah, there's the Grand Staircase National Monument down here. 
uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. There's also national preserves like Mojave National Preserve. This is our campsite in Mojave National Preserve two years ago. After a lot of rain, it doesn't show you the flowers there, but there was a super bloom going on. It, it was just absolutely magnificent. And of course, there's just zillions of these crazy Joshua trees all over. This is our dispersed campsite. Nobody else was around here. Uh, we saw nobody, we had it all to ourselves. There was a dirt road leaving essentially from our campsite that went for potentially miles. But we hiked on that, we explored creek beds, beautiful views of the mountains. So national preserves are also a great place to do dispersed camping. Where to go? Let's first talk about John's 99% rule. Here it is. 99% of the people go to 1% of the locations. This is true for just about anything you can think of. For example, 99% of the people want to go to the Yosemite Valley floor. Let's go to the Yosemite Valley floor. So that is a zoo. If you want to hike or explore, don't go to the Yosemite Valley floor. Go to other places in the Sierra Nevada that are not in national parks or near it, and there will be nowhere near as many people. This is also the case for dispersed camping. If you want to do dispersed camping, if you want to hike in Yosemite National Park and you want to do dispersed camping near Yosemite National Park, you're gonna have a lot of company. There's gonna be a lot of people jockeying for whatever dispersed campsites there are in the national forests surrounding Yosemite National Park. You're not gonna get much solitude and you might have some trouble finding places. There may even be some restrictions by the national forest there. They might even be closing off some spaces because of that. I'm not saying they have, but if it gets crowded enough, that could be something that happens. I love Southern Utah. Uh, Stephanie and I have been there several times. I've been there a dozen times in my life. It's like my second place that I go to outside of Northern California for just to enjoy the beauty of nature because to me there's nothing else like Southern Utah and the Colorado Plateau. But if you want to do dispersed camping anywhere near Moab, Utah and Canyonlands and Arches National Park, just be prepared to have a lot of people around you. I've seen photos of people doing dispersed camping and the vehicles are like 10 feet apart from each other. It's like a parking lot. So keep that in mind. A key thing about where you can go is of course, the road requirements of your vehicle. What can your vehicle safely handle? I mean, that's a limiting factor right there and a key one. What do you want to do? Do you want to hike? Do you want to fish? Do you want to do mountain climbing? What is it that you want to do? Think about that when you're choosing where you want to go. Of course, your time frame. If you've only got three days and two nights, stay really, really local. If you've got a week or two or three or more, you have a lot more options to travel more widely and explore. Let's talk about the research you need to do ahead of time. You need to get official information from agency personnel. The best way to do that, I think, is in person. Of course, this is COVID times right now as I'm doing this, this webinar. We do have a vaccine. Things are looking up. Eventually, you may be able to go in in person to a lot of these places. I, I think eventually you will be, hopefully not in the, hopefully uh, in the not too distant future. So in person, if you can, on the phone is second best, online is third. If you can do it in person or when you can do it in person, you can go in there with your maps and they can actually show you places on your maps and give you detailed instructions. You can also do that on the phone, but not as easily. Online can be useful, of course, but uh, a lot of the official uh, websites, they're not necessarily updated daily with road closures or things like that. It's that person that's at the desk in the agency office, like for example, uh, Don Lee at the Mount Shasta Ranger Station is an incredible resource for whatever you wanna do in the Mount Shasta area, including letting you know places where you can go to uh, disperse camping. You wanna make sure that you get maps, maps and maps and lots of maps. I love maps, paper maps, especially. Um, 
I'm of a generation where I started out with paper maps and I know a lot of people are using things on their phones and tablets and all that stuff and that can be useful, but always make sure you have paper maps, maps as a backup and that you know how to use them. Agency maps, motor vehicle use maps. Most agencies, National Forest, BLM, are producing motor vehicle use maps. They are in print and for sale. You can also often download them as PDF files and then print out specific sections that are important to you. They show you what roads are open, what roads are closed, and things of that nature. Just be aware that you they're not always uh, totally up to date. You could think, oh, this road is open and you get there and that road is closed. So just, just be aware that they are a very good guide. They're not always gonna be 100% accurate. That's why you need to call on the phone or go in in person. There are also the big maps that you get that are of the entire forest, oftentimes like the Shasta Trinity National Forest map, Klamath National Forest map that show you most of the roads and give you indications of the road surface. Oftentimes, whether it's two wheel drive, four wheel drive, that can be useful. But then again, you can't count on that for sure for reliability, but they are great for planning and giving you an overall uh, big picture of what you can do. Um, there are also websites with maps. My favorite is caltopo.com, caltopo.com. Check that out. You can get maps for hiking. You can get maps for with roads for dispersed camping. Make sure you use that menu that's over on the right-hand side of the screen and look at it and poke around with it. You can choose motor vehicle use maps. You can choose wildfires, there's just shading, there's all sorts of GIS layers essentially that you can put on that map. Strongly urge you to check out caltopo.com. There is also my website, dispersedcamping.net, which is part of northerncaliforniahikingtrails.com actually, it, it forwards through. I have pages with lips, lists of apps and websites uh, websites that some of them list places where you can go to dispersed camping. There are apps now that show you sites for dispersed camping. Take those with a grain of salt. Those are crowdsourced. There could be some good information there, but I can tell you that they, they are just very incomplete. I've gone and looked at places that I know well, like for example, Siskiyou County and they, they don't have most of the sites in many ways that, that may be a blessing in some ways, but just be aware that those websites and apps can be useful, but they're not gonna give you the whole picture. There are of course many apps you can use on your phone or GPS unit for navigating outdoors. Your friends, especially your good friends that know about cool kick-ass dispersed camping sites may be willing to share with you those and maybe especially if they tell you to not put them on those those websites that list them. Uh, the problem with that it's not that I am opposed to those things it's just some of those things are just one campsite and if it's way out there if you drive 15 miles out there and there's three people there's three vehicles in a place where there's only one and you don't get to stay there it's just you know it's a part of it is just uh uh, just, just have some awareness of, around that. But that said, there are people who love to share and do share. And um, I will be sharing later some places you can, you can go in Siskiyou County. We talked about friends, let's talk about social media. Facebook is the best for that. There are a large number of groups. Some of them are geographic based for travel. Others are specifically boondocking and dispersed camping. You can go on there and say, hey, I'm going to be traveling to such and such place, or hey, we're going to go up to Crater Lake for a few days, or there are places to do dispersed camping near Crater Lake, and people may tell you, yeah, here, here, here. So keep those in mind as resources. Key thing before you go, I mean, this is research, but also just good advice. Make sure your vehicle is truly in good shape. Make sure that your fluid levels are topped off, that your belts are looking good, your tire pressure is good, all those sorts of things, because you really don't want your vehicle to break down when you are way, way, way out there. 
supplies. I have a detailed list in the appendices of my book, Camp for Free. I also have that same list on dispersedcamping.net. When you get to those pages, you will find that there. Make sure you check the weather. That is crucial. You don't want to get way down a dirt road that is dusty but passable and then a storm comes in and drops two inches of rain and you are out there and that road that you need to get back is now an impassable muddy track and you either have to wait for it to dry or you have to try to get through and risk getting seriously stuck. So check the weather. We recently bought a really good sea crane portable radio that has weather band. And that's a way in most parts of the country you can get a weather band station. So that's a way to get up to date forecasts that can be crucial because weather can change, especially if you're out there for a few days. One example of when the weather caused us some minor problems was May, 2019, we were in Southern Utah we had left Zion National Park, a lot of rainy weather. And I thought, oh, we're just going to go camping. I believe it was in Dixie National Forest. And I hadn't called ahead, but I, I'd, I'd been in the area before. I had, I had maps of the area. And I knew if we went up this one highway up into the mountains, there were several dirt roads going off. We just needed to park and sleep for the night. We were going to get up early and head into Bryce. Well, it was raining and the rain stopped and we drove down a dirt road found a good place to do dispersed camping, went to sleep. Then I woke up at dawn and there was three inches of snow on the ground. I immediately woke up Stephanie. We jumped in the front seats and we made it out of there, no problem. We were able to, to deal with the snow and we drove down out of the snow, but that was a situation where I had not adequately planned for the situation. I, I hadn't thought enough about the snow level. Uh, I knew that there could be snow at higher elevations and I was concerned about that, but I didn't realize that where I was driving up into that I was gonna be driving up the 9,000 feet. Later that day, the snow melted off and you can see here we are in Bryce. Uh, everything worked out fine. We had beautiful scenery and there was only a little bit of snow left. Finding dispersed camping sites. Okay, there's an entire chapter in the book about that, but I'm going to hit the highlights here for you. Typically, you start on a portal road that leaves from a public road, a county road, oftentimes. This road is usually maintained by the Forest Service or BLM, might be paid for a while. Oftentimes, it's dirt. It's the main road. You may see dispersed camping sites along this road. You may decide to do that. I typically want a lot more privacy. So I don't like to camp along those portal roads unless, um, unless it's just, I, I don't feel like I have a, a other good options. But what you wanna do from that portal road is you want to take a secondary road, again, one that is suitable for your vehicle. So you're on the secondary road, suitable for your vehicle. And let's say you don't know for sure about a, a dispersed campsite. You just know that this is a general area one where you want to be. You've done some research with maps. You know that there's roads out here, and you think you you got a pretty good uh, pretty good chance of finding uh, finding some dispersed campsites out here. So you're on your secondary road. You need to make sure you don't get lost. What I do is I take a uh, I take a portable digital recorder, a handheld digital recorder. You can do this on your smartphones. You can write it down on a notepad if you want. Just what I do, I just reset my travel odometer to zero. And then I say it's 0 0.6 miles. I turn right on road such and such. Usually they're names, sometimes they're not, but I would just say I went right out of four. 1.2 miles later, I went left out of four. Then 0.2 mile later, I found the dispersed campsite that I'm at. And that's also good, that helps you, you can then retrace, retrace your steps to the portal road, then that's also good later on for you to take notes on your dispersed campsite so that you can find it again in the future if you wanna go back there. You can also use GPS with an app to uh, record a trace. Uh, that will also help you get back. So that is another way to do that, but you wanna make sure that you don't get lost out there. 
When in doubt, scout. So you're driving along one of these secondary roads and either you haven't found a dispersed campsite yet or you just saw a mediocre one. You think, ah, we'd like something better, but the road starts getting a little iffy. And you think, well, we can make that, but I can only see the next 50 yards and I don't know what's beyond that. And I don't know how bad the road gets. Stop your vehicle, get out and scout, walk up the road, keep going. Could be you walk hundred yards up that road and you go, oh man, here's this dynamite kick ass site. Wow. And you look and you say, yeah, the vehicle can make it. You go up there, you've got your great site. However, you don't want to get in a situation where you start driving up an iffy dirt road that gets worse and worse. And you're starting to think, geez, I don't even know if I can drive further on this road. And then you say, I don't have a good place to turn around. And then you wind up having to very slowly back down that road. So when in doubt, scout. The characteristics of a good site. A good site is a legal site. You wanna make sure you follow those rules and regulations. It is level or near level. If it's not completely level, make sure it's level left to right, side to side, and then point your head on the uphill side so that when you're sleeping, your head is on the uphill side. It'll help prevent headaches. What sort of scenery surroundings do you like and what activities are nearby that you would like to do? Those are some important things you wanna think about when you're getting a site. Some safety considerations. Be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. You wanna make sure you have everything you need. You'll likely bring some things that you don't need, but you might need. So really go through that and just yeah, one more time. It's, it's in the book and it's on the website. I've got that list of important things for you to take. As I mentioned earlier, don't get lost when you're finding your dispersed campsite. Also, if you go wandering and hiking around, pay really close attention to how you got to where you are so you can get back to your vehicle and your campsite. Pick a safe site. By this, I mean, this could be a whole lot of things, but just make sure it seems safe to you. Like if you park your vehicle under a tree that is leaning way over, you think it could fall. Yeah, you don't wanna be there. Are you parked under a steep cliff that's got big boulders at the top and you kind of think, hmm, I wonder, I see other boulders right around here. Could a boulder roll down and smash my vehicle? Think about those sorts of things. I say a lot more about this in the book about animals and a lot of safety things. I just wanna say a little bit about bears. Keep your sight crumb clean, meaning keep anything scented um, inside your vehicle basically. And we keep ours inside airtight containers. They're wrapped inside Ziploc bags, inside other bags, inside other bags, inside an airtight container, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's what we do to keep bears away from the campsite. All right, let's get on to something that we all do. Many of you I know have great vehicles and I'm envious and you just got this, you just got this nice comfy toilet in there and you're all set or you've got a, like a, a portable toilet that you love. You're all good to go. That's great. More power to you. For those of us like, well, us with our minivan, we're pretty much doing it outside when we're out in the wilderness. So here's just the key things. If you're pooping in the woods, you want to be at least 200 feet away from water and far away from where anybody's going to be walking or going. Dig that hole 10 feet, uh, 10, yeah, dig, it, dig it 10 feet deep, I dare you. Uh, uh, six to 10 inches deep, bury your waist, pack out your toilet paper. I've been packing it out for years. It's not that big of a deal. You'll get over it. Use Ziploc bags, et cetera, et cetera. In desert environments, and really sensitive environments or places where just lots and lots and lots of people go, you should pack it out. Research it online. There are special bags you can buy. There's you know, lots of things you can do. It is kind of gross, but you get used to it. Those of us that uh, have or have had dogs, you know, you know the you know the you know the drill that you use with the poop bags for your dogs. You can do this. It's not that big of a deal. It's what the environment needs. Peeing. Just do it far from water, spread it around. 
On the Siskiyou County, yes. Siskiyou County has got just lots and lots of places to do dispersed camping. I only know just a tiny, small portion. There's just thousands of miles of roads in Siskiyou County that you could potentially drive down. There's just places all over there. Remember my 99% rule that 1%, 99% uh, of the people are gonna go to 1% of the places. So for example, um, people love Mount Shasta and a lot of people do it. There it is, there's some legal dispersed camping on Mount Shasta. It's really crowded there. I would urge you to not do it. I uh, urge you to go out to the areas farther away from the mountain. You can still find places with good views of the mountain, by the way, uh, especially if you're willing to do some hiking, but there's just places all over in Siskiyou County where you can do it. And let's just look a little bit here. The Klamath National Forest has the most land in Siskiyou County. I'll show you the two other forests soon. So um, here's Mount Shasta right here. Here's we just to get you orange. And here's Wairika, this is I-5. Here is the uh, Trinity Divide Mountains or uh, over in here. Here's the Marble Mountain West Wilderness, the Russian Wilderness and the Trinity Alps Wilderness. There are roads that penetrate not into the wilderness of course, but all around the edges, there are dirt roads there. And then just in this national forest all here, there's lots of dirt roads where you can go in and do dispersed camping in incredibly beautiful sites. Here's Klamath National Forest. Let's have a look at Shasta Trinity. It essentially is to the south of Klamath National Forest, it stretches down into Shasta County. A lot of good lands to explore down here to the south of Siskiyou County. And finally, Modoc National Forest. I couldn't find uh, as good of a map. And by the way, all the maps that I showed you are Creative Commons maps from Wikipedia or the US Forest Service or BLM. This is Modoc National Forest. This is Eastern Siskiyou County and then over into Modoc County. Over in here, there's like hardly anybody. You want solitude and be alone, you head out into Modoc National Forest, you get into high desert, really beautiful country there. I'm going to show you a couple of places where there are a couple of areas in Siskiyou County that you can access uh, quite a few dispersed campsites fairly easily. Many of these you can actually do in a two wheel drive vehicle and set up a tent if that's what you're doing. This is up South Fork Road from the town of Mount Shasta. You just swing around Lake Siskiyou and then keep going up into the upper reaches of the drainage. You can see Gumboot Creek is right up here. There are some, some dirt roads right off, in, right off in here where there are dispersed camping sites. There's actually a campground at Gumboot Lake and there's more dirt, road, dirt roads downstream to the east off this map that where you can actually go and explore. There's quite a few sites there. I've, I've been down several of those roads, lots of great places. There's also really good hiking nearby that is in my books, other books elsewhere, but that you really should explore. It's a great hike just to actually walk the road to Cedar Lake and Cliff Lake. Cliff Lake is really maybe perhaps the prettiest lake in the whole Trinity Divide. You can also hike on the Pacific Crest Trail here from Gumboot, uh, well here's Gumboot Saddle, but you can catch it here or you can catch it up here. And uh, you can go north towards Mount Addy, you can go south down towards Seven Lakes Basin, just stunning, beautiful territory to explore here. So that's a really good area to go. And it's um, yeah, maybe a 20 minute drive from Mount Shasta. Another good area to go is Tamarack Flat. This is up, Road 17, the Stewart Springs Road that goes up to Parks Creek Saddle. This is a few miles downhill from Park Creek Saddle. That's actually where you catch the PCT to go to the Deadfall Lakes and climb Mount Eddy. Tamarack Flat, you just drop down a pretty good dirt road. It's also pretty close across from the trail that goes up to Caldwell Lakes here. That's a very nice hike too. There are dirt roads here with several websites excuse me, several campsites that, uh, 
where you can do dispersed camping. It's very pretty. You get to see these ridges, these metamorphic ridges here. There's a meadow. There's a gorgeous creek. Very, very nice area. There's going to be other people there because it is easily accessible, but it is a really, really great place to explore. I'm about ready to finish up with the main part of my presentation. I just wanted to briefly talk about my website, Northern California uh, Hiking Trails.com. If you hit dispersed camping, if you type in dispersed camping.net, you will come to this page. And if you come down, you'll see an order link for the book. You can only order it on Amazon as of right now, it's only available on Amazon. Uh, I hope within a few months to have it available in, in bookstores, but uh, I'm still working on making that happen. You will also see links to resources that I mentioned earlier for dispersed camping. You can also find out a lot more information about the various uh, hiking books I've written. And then I have a blog where I write lots of posts about where to hike and other stuff like that. There's also a link to my Northern California Hiking Trails uh, Facebook page there, and I'm quite active on that. So with that, uh, I want to thank you all for sticking with me. I hope you got a lot out of the presentation and that you are excited to get out there soon and do some dispersed camping. And I am ready for questions. All right, great. Thanks, John. Thanks for all of that information and so many things to consider. And the timing is great. We're um, happy to have been able to do this with you in the spring. As I look at some of the folks over on the attendees list, I see some people there who I know are gonna be heading out for camping um, sometime soon. Fantastic. Uh, once the snow melts here in the Mount Shasta area anyway. So um, I do have a question for you right here. We'll wait for um, more questions to come in, but Rebecca Franco asks, what do you think of the services like Harvest Host? Harvest Host is, uh, that is absolutely great. Now, Harvest Host is not dispersed camping, really. Harvest Host is a website that connects people who are in vans, or a lot of them are in RVs, actually. It, it connects them so people that have land that have like farms and ranches and things like that, you pay a fee and you get to go park your vehicle on their, their ranch or their farm. I think that could be absolutely great. It's not what I personally do because I do dispersed camping, but I, I've heard people say really good things about it and, and, and they like it. So if that sounds appealing to you, yeah, by all means do that. So John, I just had a question come to mind as I wait to see if we've got any questions coming in. We have lots of kudos coming in, people really appreciating the presentation, but um, one of the questions that just came to mind for me is if someone is used to camping in developed campgrounds and is starting to think about, oh, you know, maybe I do want to do dispersed camping, do you have any recommendations of like, easy ways to get started. You know, like don't pick something really epic and distant for your first trip. Do something that can help you build your experience and your confidence. Is there sort of a beginner version of dispersed camping or some guidelines for um, just getting started? Yeah, absolutely. What I suggest is that you do something that is close to where you live so you're not driving a long ways. And definitely do your research ahead of time. For example, Tamarack Flat that I, that I just shared, that would be a good place to go in Siskiyou County. It's right by a paved road. And so there's easy access. You don't have to worry. There's no way you're gonna get lost really getting there. So you don't have to worry about that. You really don't have to worry about your vehicle getting bogged down. The paved road is right there with, some traffic on it if there was ever like, oh, like an emergency or, oh, I can't start my car or you know, just something like that, you could, you could get help pretty easily. So that's what I would suggest. I would say, do something that is local and easy, maybe just do it for one night or you know, two nights or whatever. And then you, if, if you like it, which you probably will, then, then you're good. But for some reason it's like, oh, you know, I just can't take this. Well, you're not that far from home if you want to turn around and drive home. So, so, you know, so, so keep that in mind. But if you can, make yourself tough it out. You know, one thing that can happen is 
the first few times you do dispersed camping is it's just kind of you out there you're in the wilderness. And Renee, I know you've done a ton of backpacking. And so you do that backpacking. It's like, it's just me out here in the woods alone, or maybe you have a companion, but I know you've done a, a lot of backpacking alone and you have to get used to that. It's the same thing with dispersed camping that you have to adjust to that. But over time you, you get you get used to it and, and you grow to really, really like it. Well, thanks for that, John. I'm getting a kick out of the comments that are coming in. We're being encouraged to smile, John. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, we do have a question too um, here. Have you used iOverlander? I personally have not used iOverlander, but that's one of those apps. And um, I, uh, there are people that use those apps and find them very, very useful. I have not really played around with them much because I know lots of places to go disperse camping where I go all the time and those apps don't, they only have a small percentage of the potential places. Plus I like to go where people aren't. Mm -hmm. So if there's a site that's on that app, then uh, there's a decent chance that there's gonna be somebody else there and that's not that's not what I want. And, and just one other quick piece of advice, if you're going to first camping, um, it's always good to have a backup plan. Like, oh, I know about this. I, there's this one dispersed camping site that I'm going to that, oh, it's good, to, I love it there. Have a couple of others that you know about, hopefully that are nearby that are your backups in case you go there and that, that site is taken. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice, especially now I know here in Mount Shasta, it's been really obvious last summer and I expect we'll see again this summer, there are just a lot more people outdoors during mm -hmm. COVID. And yeah, uh, there, there have been, there have been a lot, of, a lot more people outdoors. And I, yeah. I definitely noticed that when I was down in Siskiyou County. Yeah. Uh, there's just a lot more people. And, and overall, that's absolutely great. I want people outdoors and, and enjoying the outdoors. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, well, so here's another question from Rebecca to really draw on your experience. Have you ever had to deal with illegal grow sites in remote areas? And what should we look for to avoid those sites? All right, yeah, that, that, is, that is a good question. There are illegal grow sites out there. Um, for one, I would follow your instincts on these sorts of things. Like if you are going down a dirt road and you see people around there that make you feel uncomfortable, leave. I mean, you should always do that. You need to trust your instincts on that. And I'm not an expert on marijuana grows in the forest. I, my intuition is that they are less common than they used to be because now that it's legal to grow for the most part, there, there's not as much of an incentive to, to, to do it out there, but, Yes, you need to be careful with marijuana grows, but to the extent that I've researched that, they don't necessarily want to have problems with you. And I don't think if you were driving on a dirt road that you would just come into a marijuana grow. I think their marijuana grow would be away from a dirt road. So I, I doubt you were just going to drive into one. But if you did, or if you were out walking cross country and came across one, then the the advice is you just you just kind of uh, casually turn around and go back to your vehicle and get the hell out of there and then it's up to you if you want to report it or not i would if it's an illegal grow personally i would report it um but uh, that's that's your ethics and your thing there but uh don't stick around and if there is somebody there just act like hey no big deal just walking by, just hiking, and you know, and just 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 get out of there. That's what I would say. Uh, I don't think it's very a very common occurrence. Yeah, thanks, John. And a question from Jim Farmer: Is dispersed camping treated the same as backcountry camping? I know Whiskey Town NRA allows backcountry, and I'm curious about dispersed. Oh, I know about those backcountry sites um, at Whiskey Town. I would consider that dispersed camping if if they're the sites that I'm thinking about. I remember there was a couple of sites or a site that was up, uh, up Brandy Creek and things like that. I, I would consider that a form of dispersed camping. Some of those, like that's a national recreation area. In a few cases, there's some kind of hybrid situations 
and I am not totally up to speed on what uh, Whiskey Town NRA is doing, but in the past, you had to sign up for those sites, and you might even have to pay money, but you drive out there, and I think it's just a big cleared area. I don't know if there's a picnic table or not, but it's, it's, it's basically, it's a remote campsite. That's kind of a hybrid form of dispersed camping because there's certainly not many people around and you'd have a lot of privacy. Okay, all right, thanks. And then um, we do have a question here from Facebook about Tamarack Flats. Do you know if it's um, an okay road for an R-Pod with a forerunner? An R-Pod with a forerunner, what is an R-Pod? That's going to be one of those cute new sort of tear shot. Tier tier oh, okay, that's what I yeah. thought it was, but I just wanted to be sure. Um, my guess is yes, but you know what you need to do? You need to call, I think that's on the Shasta Trinity um, Ranger District, I think, not sure. But uh, so you need, to, you need to call the agency with jurisdiction and ask. But I have driven down that road, and, and my sense is that, yeah, you can. But uh, I would get the official word from, uh, I think it would be the Manchester Ranger Station you would call for that. Yeah, thanks. And a question that just came to mind for me, and I wonder, you know, last fall, how closely you were watching this. We had forest closures here last mm -hmm. fall because of the fire danger. Mm -hmm not necessarily related to COVID. During that period of time, do you have recommendations for the places to get the most updated information from agencies when things are changing and, and being reevaluated on a really short time frame? Yes, well, you can check the agency website. That's always a, a good thing to do. You can call them. Also though, most of these agencies now have Facebook pages and they, they seem to be pretty good about updating things on their Facebook pages. They want you to know. They don't want people, they don't want 500 people to drive into a national forest and then get turned around. So they want to get that message out there. So they're, they're usually pretty good at posting it on their website. They, they have a, like a section for news or press releases. And then again, on social media, they'll put it out there also. And that's something like we're, we're way behind across uh, certainly uh, California is way it's in drought conditions now. And I would not be surprised if we wind up coming into the summer way behind on precipitation, way below normal snowpack and looking at potential closures, you know, getting into to August and beyond. And also wildfires and piece of advice I would give people if you're planning your summer recreation now, given the way things are looking with the snowpack and the water moisture in the soil right now and how that's likely to be below normal going into the summer, there's a, a pretty good chance that we're gonna have a lot of wildfires again. And that's gonna mean a lot of smoke, certainly. And it may be more smoke than you wanna deal with so if you can plan your plan your trips for June and July before the major fires have happened and, and, and hopefully before there's some road closures in some areas, you may even be able to find that there are places that you can get to in late May that you know, 10, 20 years ago, you would have thought, oh, I would only go there in late June, early July. It's like, it's like June is the new July now. That's just the way it is. Uh, last, last Memorial Day weekend, we went hiking in the Northern Trinity Alps and there was hardly any snow below about 6,000 feet. And we were able to hike into some high mountain lakes with just a few patches of snow. So yeah. keep, that, you know, keep that in mind about planning. Try to do it earlier in the summer rather than later. Yep, and that's my thinking as well. So um, let's see, we have a, a reply here in the chat regarding that question about Tamarack Flat. Someone shared that in late May of last year, he took a 27 foot motorhome into Tamarack Flat, no problem. So there he's got a road update from last yeah. season. Yeah. And then also folks, uh, Kim is posting the links right now to the Facebook pages for our local national forest 
um, the Shasta Trinity, the Klamath, the Modoc. I know I look at the Shasta Trinity a lot to see what's going on. Um, it's been a, a great information source and they update frequently. So it's been really helpful to make use of those. And I'm taking a look here to see if we've got any other questions, folks, for John. It's been so rich with information here this evening. Lots to consider and lots to inspire, too, as we, uh, we all start thinking about that season that is definitely coming earlier. So yes. I, don't see, yep, I don't see anything else coming in. So, John, I want to say thank you so much for sharing your resources tonight and you know all these years that you have done so and um, really really appreciate the resources and the enthusiasm and the sharing of news and information that you put out through your social media feeds as well yours is another one of the resources that I look to when I am trying to figure things out for anyone who's thinking about backpacking John has a list of spring backpacking suggestions uh, in the North State. So um, there are those options as well. And we've got people in the chat just saying thank you, John, for sharing your information. Thanks so much for this evening, folks. The uh, webinar will get put up, the recording will get put up. So uh, you're welcome to watch it again or share it with friends. And join us again on April 20th for a webinar from the Mount Shasta Trail Association about the projects they have coming up this year. And with that, I will say good night to everyone. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I had a great time. Get out there and enjoy the outdoors and enjoy dispersed camping.